Uh, as Stephen said, my name is Doug Gourlay with Skyport Systems, and I really appreciate you guys joining us today. And um, well, let's just uh, set those down. We'll just have them pass them around. We'll be good. The couple folks here with me today that I just kind of point out may ask to stand up and, uh, you know, do you know who's who around here? Over here, the first person uh, I'd already identified, uh, Lisa Kaywood. Lisa's uh, recently joined Skyport within the past few months and leading a lot of the marketing functions around here on messaging, uh, actually how we describe what we do, um, as well as helping organize uh, events like this. Uh, Dan, the man Backman over here, uh, we'll be going through a couple demos and some interesting things uh, showing what's real. So you can take the section of my presentation and go, oh, dear God, he said what? And then Dan goes, oh, no, here's what's actually really done in the product. And uh, a couple of folks in the back uh, that will be coming up in a little bit, Michael Beasley, <coughs> Will Etherton are two of our founders, CTO and head of engineering, Russ Rice on product management and marketing back there, and Megan Knox and Nick Giampa join us on the sales and go-to-market function. So we've been growing a lot over the last couple of years and this is really one of our more public outcomings or whatever the right word is I struggle with that after too many Red Bulls coming out parties yes um, word dyslexia it's exciting and um, we talk about what we're doing, give a little more detail into the deep dives of the product. Now, the way I'd normally kick one of these off is like, hey, let's talk about some questions that you guys have, because, but we're kind of new in the space. So instead, I'm going to go a little bit through a presentation. I'm going to try not to skip all the marketing fluffy crap, okay? And ask that what we can do is, if you have questions about the technology or how the product works, I'm not going to say hold it to the end, but wait just a slide or two, because that may be coming up. And then when we get done with, the set, with that section on the technical overview of the product, let's kind of open it up and pile on all the questions that that made. Okay, I think I might make it a little bit easier for people watching as well as ensure that I don't end up skipping three slides ahead to explain a point or something like that. Uh, this is the fluffy marketing slide, okay? The short version is there are no silver bullets in security. In fact, a lot of companies, in fact, there's like 1,200 funded companies in security in the last three years, and a lot of them think that technology can fix security. I would joke that a lot of them are features masquerading as companies or products masquerading as companies. And that's created an entire, really, ecosystem problem that we face, which is how many products does somebody have to deploy to secure an environment today? A thing we'll go through in the end, how many products do you have to deploy to secure a single server nowadays for a reasonably critical application? Just noodle on that and then say, are they even integrated? How do I manage all of them? That becomes one of the real challenges, especially large enterprises have huge teams of people to solve this. Does a mid-market customer have a team of people to do integration to solve these types of challenges? Um, next slide. When we were designing the system over the past couple years in the architecture, a couple things came out in the public eye that significantly influenced how we built what we have today. I kind of want to go through those thought processes with you and give you a little insight into why we built what we built and then what we built. Uh, the first was, how do we protect against low-level root kits, malware, corrupted BIOS, SSD firmware attacks? Let's be really blunt. The JP Morgan attack had a lot of servers in the core of the data center root kitted for like over 90 days. That's an extremely low-level attack. The US government has had SSD firmware violated which then would write malware into the operating system as it booted on top of that SSD. How do you prevent against those types of attacks? Or as one of our customers said, how do I prove that the only software running on my x86 is the software I want and nothing else? When you think about the x86 architecture and its evolution over the past couple years, past decade or so, I would argue the server vendors have done a phenomenal job of trying to make it as easy to use as possible and capable of running as much software as it possibly could to grow the market. The entire shift to open computing, open systems has done that. The net result is it can run software that you don't necessarily want it to run. And that's one of the key problems we have today, remote code execution, malware, so on. <laughs> We decided we needed software-defined perimeters that operate at the application layer. This is that Goldilocks problem that like Martin Casado at VMware has talked about. If you put security at the network edge, you end up with 50,000 line ACLs, tons of pinholes through it. Or as one of our customers saw, it was really interesting, they said, we're going to deploy an active directory system on you. Okay, they spin it up. 30 minutes later, our head of customer success gets a call. 
uh, your system says we're getting scanned from China. And we're like, he's like, it, it, really? That, that's like impossible. We just spun this thing up. Turns out the IP address that they used for the Active Directory read-only domain controller was a reclaimed IP address in a subnet that three years prior it had some other application that somebody had put a rule in the firewall that said permit IPNENE -E -E to go to this IP address. And when they decommissioned the workload and decommissioned, you know, shut it down, nobody went back and told the firewall guy to shut the policy off. It's one of 50,000 lines. Fast forward a few years, you re reopen it up, and next thing you know, you're getting scanned and out. There's an estimate it takes about 30 minutes to own a Windows 7 workload that's open on the internet today. It's really cool. So we said we need to have something that gets close, that also that operates at the application layer. And it's really, really critical when I say that because let's take a look at the target attack. Right, it's been relatively well publicized. I think Brian Krebs had a great analysis of it. The rapid fire 30 second version is HVAC guy was at home, got malware on his laptop, came to an office and infected an Ariba server that he was using to open purchase orders. That went to an Active Directory device, they core dumped LSAS.exe, got tickets, used a ticket to create an Active Directory domain, on the Active Directory domain controller to create a super admin EA account, then used that to go to point of sale devices, loaded software that skimmed it backtraced it, got the, aggregated the data on a server, and then FTP'd it out. Sounds cool, right? Um, the challenge is that every single one of those little lily pad hops across enterprise happened on port 80 or port 443 or port 389 on a perfectly acceptable port and protocol between two devices that are allowed to and supposed to talk to each other. How does a edge-based micro-segmentation policy, if it only goes up to layer three or four, identify and stop that. Heartbleed was the root cause, apparently, of the JP Morgan malware intrusion. How do you prevent Heartbleed when the server is supposed to receive port 443 from the outside world? And it's become some of the challenges we deal with. If you're not operating at the application layer, you're not going to be able to see these types of malformed packets do full proxies and drop them. The other challenge of operating at the application layer is performance. And we've seen 40 gig firewalls and you turn on some of these capabilities and it becomes a four gig firewall at best. And that's four gigs that then shared across a thousand machines. <coughs> to the sort of perpetuating vicious cycle of the problem. And then forensics that can't be modified by employees or third parties. Right? It's really great to capture logs and capture statistics. A customer I was talking to recently had a problem. An engineer, the network engineer went in, was changing configurations on switches and routers and crashed part of the bank's trading plant. Okay, it's a bad day for you. <laughs> you know, your things aren't doing really good. Then the guy did the really stupid thing and said, I still want my bonus this year. I bet if I go into the syslog server and delete those logs and go to the radius tacx server and delete the entries and go over to the router and clear the log files, then nobody will find out that I did it. And that thus causing a multi-week forensic cycle in the enterprise, it did end up with the employee getting terminated, as opposed to just a slap on the wrist and, you know, bad job network guy. So how do we create log structures that can't be defeated by an admin or somebody intentionally doing something stupid? So we, know, we can always know what happened. The scenario we often use is, imagine you get an email from corporate security it says on June 6, 2014, between 1 and 2 a.m., a file appeared on the internet that says customer records.txt, and it looks like our customer records. Okay? Please tell me who created the policy on the firewall that between 1 and 2 a.m. on June 6, 2014, allowed the virtual machine's IP address where that data was hosted at that time to go outside and transmit to ftp.badguy.ru. And by the way, now we have, it was a virtual machine, it's a mobile virtual machine, it was using non-stateful vMotion, so you have to figure out what its IP address was then across 41 different time zones and three different data centers. Good luck. How would you do that today? Those are some of the challenges we said are architectural principles we wanted to solve for in creating this type of product and solution for our customers. So there's a model, though. There's a model that actually works. And you know, it's always really nice to base your inventions off of things that exist elsewhere, you can say are proven and are highly functional. The Xbox One, I've got a couple of them, they work great. There's like 20 million of these things on the internet that are not behind firewalls. They have your credit card number, they have facial recognition for you. There is an active hacker community that wants to take DVDs and clone them and get them to run the software that's supposed to run on it, but not on your version of the box because you're not licensed for it. 
and they've not figured out how to affect these types of attacks against a architecturally closed system that has signature signed software and entitlements in the software, has a central management service that the devices log in and register to. These devices are x86 based, but they realize that there's a performance problem when x86 devices try to do graphic processing. So they added in like an NVIDIA or uh, ATI GPU into the system to accelerate it. He said the model functionally works. What is the equivalent of the model for the enterprise environment? And so what we did was effectively replaced a lot of the core components of it and said, let's design this for the enterprise. Thus, a central management system so we can build a best-in-class management infrastructure designed to handle the operations and security aspects of a system, but designed for multi-tenancy so it can be consumed by a mid-market customer who may only have one or two boxes and get all those benefits for those one or two, or somebody who has a thousand or deployed on premises for a very large enterprise or government entity who would have hundreds of thousands, 10,000 type devices. An on-premises compute system that is hardened against physical threat and designed to validate all the software that runs on it before it's booted. The ability to run customer custom applications without modifying the application, without loading agents, without changing the development cycle all on top of a hardened stack with a security I.O. coprocessor that takes the functions we do and shifts many of them from the x86 execution path to fundamentally was a very intelligent NIC that looks a lot like this in its first version. Yes, we built hardware. This is the biggest, heaviest NIC you will ever see. And <laughs> seriously, I'm not kidding about the weight. It is a workout. It's better than 12 ounce curls, okay? The, let's go through the actual architecture of how we built this, though. It'll give a little bit of insight. To start with, there are two halves of the system. Okay? There is the x86 system half. This comes from Intel. It is domestically manufactured with a secured and validated supply chain as much as possible for the core components. We have a security coprocessor that's being passed around the room. Show and tell makes these so much more fun. Um, I'm going to thank whoever left it up here and hope it wasn't just randomly left up here and was actually for me to pass around because it will probably be dead after this. Um, on, the, on board, that is a 40 gig flow processor, 16 gigs of DRAM, and a lot of boot flash. Both halves of the system have TPM chips or trusted platform modules from disparate manufacturers. What they do is as a system first boots, the TPM measures registers on the system, on both halves of it, both call home to a remote attestation service that's operated in a geographically diverse hosted data center facilities. And they say, here's the measurements I see. Here's how big my BIOS image is. Here's how big, and a long hash computed for that. Here's what the checksum of my file system looks like. Here's the boot images and so on. All of those are computed and calculated, transmitted up, and when they both halves check out, both halves get a clear to boot. The system will not boot until we've checked all of the registers and we verify a couple things. There's no malware or rootkits. It's a perfectly clean, pure system that was measured in manufacturing and measured when it arrives to the customer and re-measured daily on about an eight-hour cycle and revalidating that everything is clean in the system. In short, no malware, no rootkits, no BIOS attacks. Now, I can't verify the, let's say, the Samsung SSD firmware, so our system bypasses the SSDs, the image, the boot image on the x86 side is actually hosted on the I.O. controller, validated, and then we execute a secure boot process. At this point, the operating system that's booting is a Debian derivative of SE Linux, the security enhanced Linux version that was initially developed by the National Security Agency and released to the Linux community. It whitelists all the processes and what can talk to each other from a process perspective. System boots this and we boot the Zen hypervisor with SE Linux and the DOM0 on this half, and SE Linux, a separate instance, on the security coprocessor. At this point, we can then start importing virtual machines. And when we do that, each virtual machine gets a unique instance of the NIC expressed to it using SRIOV, which is single root IO virtualization coming out of the IO controller. So up to 64 virtual NICs are created. The data path from one VM to talk to another is this virtual machine must go through the flow processor and go back. There's no software vSwitch, there's no kernel switching of this, all of that is bypassed and executed in a hardware path on that I.O. controller that's going around the room. Additionally, I mentioned software-defined perimeter or application layer proxies. 
around each virtual machine, we instantiate a single pass proxy layer. Now, somebody asked me this morning, you sound like you're a security company that does infrastructure. Why are you at Net Field Day? Besides the fact that I know Stephen and Tom and Greg and a lot of you guys, and it's a lot easier to present to a friendlier audience than it is a bunch of folks I don't know, there's a big conversation in our industry around network functions virtualization. And how do networks evolve if I need to have discrete flow paths for each traffic type in a DMZ going through all these different functions? We've implemented a single pass NFV filter system with application layer proxies for many of the major protocols and the ability to continue adding them that are executed largely in the I.O. controller so they're not performance impacting on the x86 half of the system. In short, if you expect to get 32 vCPUs, you pretty much get about 32 vCPUs, yet you can have application layer proxies running on the I.O. controller fully validating the hardware without impacting the performance on the x86 half. The type of proxies we've built, the first we call ShieldNet. It is a domain name based, zone based, and IP based classic firewall. We can filter on lab.skyport.com. As we add things to lab, they're automatically allowed. Why? Because we do a full DNS proxy in the system. This eliminates one of the major covert data exfiltration channels of using DNS. Most importantly though, we do not put a packet on the wire until we've already checked the DNS resolution, is that authorized and where is it going? So we'll see traffic when Dan does his demo that says IP not applicable. And you're like, how are you blocking something that says IPNA? Well, we didn't even create an IP packet because the DNS entry got blocked. And rather than just blocking and dropping the DNS, we resolved to a null pointer. And then we're able to say, don't even let this traffic go anywhere. We have Shield Web, which is a web application firewall. It does a cryptographic and credential proxy. What does this mean? Well, the application we're hosting in the VM on our system could be running Apache. It could be running clear text port 80. What comes out? SSL, TLS, or TLS 1.2 with only the strong cipher suite supported. The next version of Heartbleed that happens and somebody sends an email frantically by Tuesday, we have to upgrade every crypto library in here because these are owned. And of course, three months later, guys, 70% of them are still unpatched. We have to upgrade them. We can upgrade the crypto libraries real time without disrupting the workloads that are running in the system, without the application developer even being involved in it. We're hosting the SSL certificate rooted off of a hardware security module in the TPM on behalf of the hosted workload. All the SSL termination happens on our system, and the workload that's being hosted in that compartment or in that container doesn't see it. So you, normally we'd use a, a load balancer to do that. In which case you'd be putting unencrypted traffic on the wires, susceptible to passive taps, and here we didn't want to do that. Yeah, what I'm saying is today a lot of people, to avoid the crypto from the servers, they put a load balancer yeah, in absolutely. the network. It does the crypto and modernizes, and then you might run unencrypted back. Maybe, maybe not, yeah. but you're doing it transparently bumping the wire inside a hardware platform with a TPM with the crypto secured inside that hardware box. Absolutely. It meets the most rigorous requirements around. Yes, it does. And things like that. Absolutely. Sorry, I just want to expand no. on that. I Thank think. you. Yeah. No, you nailed it. Yeah. Um, somebody recorded what he said. If we can update the data sheet later, it was really good. <laughs> Let's keep it up. Um, one of the core applications that you're going to see that we're deployed for is an Active Directory production forest, or a term that's coming out now is a lot of Active Directory Red Forest, which is a highly secure AD environment for enterprise admin, super admin type credentials. Uh, this involves secure administrative workstations in vaults using encrypted paths that for administering it and so on. This would prevent a lot of the pass the ticket, pass the hash type attacks where somebody gains privileged access on a network. Uh, we've added an LDAP, an Active Directory proxy for each workload. This will let us identify things like a golden ticket attack by inspecting Kerberos tickets themselves for the date timestamp of the expiration. Doing again these packet level, protocol level things at a much upper layer beyond what normal systems have done. Or do we see multiple admin logins being tried from the same host or multiple accounts being tried from different hosts back to a same session? Um, we've implemented SSH, VNC, and RDP proxy, as well as a secured graphical console. What this does for us is effectively we've created a jump server for every server that's hosted. We can now know what admin was logged in when a policy was being violated. So imagine the scenario where you get one of 50,000, oh, a whitelist was violated, oh, we dropped a packet, oh, something looked bad. 
Right? This was, I think, what happened at Target. They said, you know, one vendor's like, yes, we found the Target breach. And the guy's like, yeah, you gave us 49,000 false positives too, dude. How are we supposed to find it with that amount of noise in the system? Anytime you do a whitelisted model and you don't have an inherent understanding of the applications, you're going to get some noise in the system. So one, you need a learning mode to learn what the traffic is supposed to be and then harden it. But two, things change. Applications get upgraded. Things get restored from backup. Admins go in and type a bad command. Uh, net use star, oh, looks like a recon attack. It's incredibly important for us to know, was an admin logged in when somebody was violating a whitelist? Was the system restored from backup? Was the policy changed in the last 24 hours or so? So giving the admin visibility when there's what looks like it might be the beginning of a breach or the beginning of a workload being infest infected, saying, well, what changed in the last 24 to 72 hours? Anything? By the way, if, if nothing changed, you may have a real problem on your hands. Can I just expand on that to make sure I understand? Please. You're saying that the Shield Admin VM in the Skyport systems could become the jump server for my business. So I would then SSH or VNC or RDP to the Shield Admin instance, and then it would create an audit log of all activities that were undertaken. Instead. For every VM that it connects to, yes. For everything I jump off to? So that then could become my central audit control point for all... Especially for critically secured things, yes. It's great. Yeah. But then again, it's in hardware with a TPM, restricted access, etc., etc. And by the way, when I talk about credential proxy, we do this across multiple areas. The web server may think the password to access a remote resource is 1234. We can actually transpose the password to the actual global credential of ABCD. A workload will get owned sometime in its life cycle, regardless of how many cool things you put around it. That password will be attempted to be stolen. Once it's stolen, it will be attempted to be reused. Let's ensure the password that's stolen is a fake password that is only useful in that compartment, on that system, rooted to that TPM. Yeah. Okay. So credential masquerading as well. So I've probably got in my network today a jump box, and I could replace it with this. In many cases, yes. Yeah. And then start at yeah, okay. And that extends the value prop of the product. Right. Yes, sir. Spot on, Greg. Okay, and the, and the jump here can go off machine then. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to go to the VMs that are then hosted on that, that system. One or the other. Both, both are options. Okay. You know, in one, we would host a Linux in, instance that you're using as the jump server with mm -hmm. specific permissions on what it's, able to be ac what, what it's able to access. This could be a production workload from someone like a Conjure or a CyberArk, or it could be your own custom. Or you could say, I'm going to allow VDI in, RDP in to a Windows host that's functioning as a secure administrative workstation, and then where it's allowed to go to to administer those specific hosts. Or it's inherently built in for any workloads that we're hosting. And in fact, Dan will talk a little bit about the SSH proxy. And it's a good test because it's like a lot of companies go, oh, we have SSH. Permit port 22. Brilliant. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't know if Dan has it on there, but Dan, go through the SSH proxy because it's really cool and how deep we go into that protocol. And I'll give you an idea of the way we're looking at this problem. Um, file system, content filtering. There's a lightweight DLP engine, regex based today. We haven't connected it to any you know, external libraries, rep service stores, or things like that. But again, we could filter down to a VM could only see a NFS directory. By the way, the VM might speak SMB. What comes out might be NFS v4 or CEFs. On the directory that it sees, we can restrict and say, can only see XLS files that are unencrypted that were written by user T. Slattery in the last 72 hours within a particular directory and subdirectory. And then on any read-in, parse the file and verify that there's no um, credit card information or social security numbers. And if you see them, X them out or deny the file read-in or file write-out. And what's the performance penalty? Uh, fairly significant. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know. Now, is it offloaded largely from the x86? Yes. But is it still significant? Yes. Uh, would I do it for everything? Absolutely not. If there's a time and place for it. So one more thing. Yeah. One of the most common things people do with uh, SSH jump boxes is start tunneling through them, which makes them pointless. Yes. Right. If you've got control, but sometimes you do need that tunnel, and sometimes you don't. Is there a way? Have we got that sort of granular levels of control over the SSH? That's exactly what I asked Dan to, to show you. It's, oh, okay. It's, Sorry. Do you want to filter out X11? Do you want to filter out SFTP over this protocol and so on? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen people using it as a HTTP proxy. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Like, yeah. That'd be yeah, X11 or VNC over and so on. Perfect. Are, are all of those instances 
per VM? Per a, VM. AKA yes. intra-VM traffic has to go out to the network and back into Actually that. has to go out through one proxy tier and then be allowed explicitly back into the other. Perfect, okay. Right? So you have to have a join between the two policies on both VMs that are, even though they're discrete in the box, yep. both policies have to align in order to allow the traffic in and out. Cool. Um, so let me give you an example, like DMZs. Uh, I use the analogy of it's a private DMZ per virtual machine that's hosted. Uh, a traditional DMZ architecture looks something like this. I, I went to, the, my favorite was the Cisco Connected Real Estate poster because I think there was an attempt to put every single icon ever created into a DMZ <laughs> services tier. If you're, in, I have two fundamental problems with this, and really it's three. I, somebody asked me what, yesterday what our core value was, and I think it's so we can actually preserve silos while allowing people to do their jobs. Picture this, you're the network guys, and you know this role. <coughs> security guy comes in and goes, I need email traffic to go this path, HTTP to go that, SSO to go this other way, FTP to go this, and he jumps servers for this, and you end up with a conglomerate of all these services, and you're trying to figure out service chaining and so on. In short, you're taking what should be, your highest priorities are usually, I want it reliable, I want it to fail over fast, and, and please, dear God, you know, just, just be quick, yeah. right? And you're. You want it to be simple. And non-fragile. And not fragile. And if something breaks, fail over quickly. And that's really like our high order bit priorities as network guys. And what ends up happening, you're told to build the most obtuse network architecture that is so complicated and complexity is the enemy of security. Yet the security team is usually the one telling you to put all this shit in line to make this thing work and it sucks. Sorry, I get a little visceral on this one. <laughs> then you're the, you're the application guy and you want to write your app and you want to deploy your app and you don't care about any of this infrastructure stuff. You just want to put it out there and know it's going to work and be in reasonably the right place. Yet the network guy tells you it has to be on a certain segment off a certain switch on a certain VLAN, which constrains your IP address. And you actually don't want to mess with that at all. You want to put the thing out there. And then the security team comes in and goes, but I need these seven agents loaded. And I need you to put these seven agents into your application. This one's going to do some micro-segmentation stuff. This one's going to do some image signing stuff. This one's going to do some reporting. And then I'm going to nag, nag you. Effectively, it becomes nagware, because now I'm going to nag you every time you disable one of these. And what's the first thing you do as an app developer when something isn't performing right? You disable the seven agents, the security team, and everybody else made you put in the thing. So it becomes a really not happy problem. I was talking to some CISOs. They're like, yeah, I have an entire team of people whose job is to walk around and wrap developers on the head and go, can you please load the agents again? It's not a healthy environment. And the security guy, they actually just want visibility to all this stuff. And they're being saying, well, I'm going to own these boxes and you own those boxes so that we can have some discrete role and so I can get my information without breaking your stuff. What we try to do is recreate these per VM DMZ so that the security team can get their visibility into the system, get the reports they need, the audit, the PCAP function. By the way, one thing I didn't mention, we do hardware packet capture on a per VM or per entitlement basis or per entitlement miss basis. So we can say, capture everything that's dropped. Switches that we used to preach drop and count. Firewalls were drop, count, and log effectively. Now we're saying drop, count, log, and capture every frame that's dropped. So we can tell exactly what it was dropped, why it was dropped, and give more visibility into the environment. We want to give the security team their view, the location team their view, the network team their view, and let everybody do their jobs effectively without stepping on each other, creating a, a DMZ that has the smallest, most finite policy possible for what that VM needs. When you think of 50,000 line ACLs, I don't need 50,000 line ACLs when I'm securing one virtual machine and one workload. I can audit what it's talked to in the last 90 days or year. And I can look at that and say, let's use that to inform policy creation. Does this workload need to go to Windows Update Server? Deny. Does it need to go to Terracotta? Deny. Or do we allow those things? My Windows Update Service might be allowed to connect out and then talk inside to other servers, only using specific ports and protocols. Let's go to the next one. Backing all of this up, I talked about the forensics aspect. How do we get and harvest this data? We've built a architecture that scales to a multi-petabyte architecture that, that logs every single packet that goes in and out of that server, every DNS lookup, and every administrative session for the lifetime of that server and the customer. The atomic unit we measure and we record against is the virtual machine or the workload and that compartment ID. So what are some operational things that happen day to day in the real world? You back something up and then you restore it over here. You do a VM migration. It used to be IP address 5, now it's IP address 10.7. We preserve the atomic identity of the workload through virtual machine mobility, through shutdowns and restarts, through backups and restores. So what you see is a single contiguous log file for that workload, what it does, regardless of where it ran. We 
store all of that. We're able to go back in time and see what traffic happened whenever. Literally, we can go back and say, on a one hour window or 30 minute window on two years ago, show me every flow that was created. Show me the policy that allowed it. Show me the version of the policy in effect at that time and who the admin was who created it. It gives us the ability to go back in time and see what actually was happening with the, biggest, the best degree of detail possible. We have a real-time data service to keep it quick for things that happened in the last week to the last 30 days, really fast and responsive there. And we built a secure enclave that has a hardware security manager, key management, credential management, so on, into the system so that we do private keying per node. So any traffic past the node is encrypted, so just that node can decrypt it, allowing you know, really, really strict tenancy to be built into the environment so that we never cross tenants or cross enterprises. So in short, we built probably the best version we could possibly design of an enterprise class, carrier class, administration and management security system, designed it in a multi-tenant model so it can be broken down to any customer size that acquires one box or 10 boxes without having to go and rebuild all that infrastructure themselves, which is that onerous, almost impossible task. I sat with a dozen CIOs a couple months ago and asked a very simple question. If you want to build the most secure server possible and we have a kind of this kind of spec of stuff you need to do, how long would it take your best IT team to build that? And one guy came back and said, at least a couple years. And it'd be a lot of custom integration to do that. Therefore, we'll never do it. He said, I can do it in about 25 minutes. You plug a box in, turn it on, it calls home, it validates itself, it registers, and it's immediately available to be under management. Stupid question. So is there any integration to like current VMware environments or this is a total you know, get rid of current ESX infrastructure and use this for those VMs going forward that you want to truly secure? Day one, it's a Zen-based hypervisor and we okay. do not have a plug-in or integration to VMware. Although we were actually hosting uh, vCenter, okay. which is kind of interesting, and uh, SCOM and SCVM in a Microsoft environment. Um, over time, absolutely. I think you're going to see us move on a trajectory of increased platform independence which would be ESX support, multiple hardware form factors, uh, potentially even software and cloud-based versions, yeah. working through a couple different channels. Our intent up front was how do I build the most secure environment and start with that as our baseline. If you're going to establish a root of trust in an enterprise that went through a breach, you say, I'm going to do one thing right, I'm going to do it really right, and then I'm going to grow on top of that. We took the same approach here and said, let's build one thing really well. Designed it to be relatively broad aperture, but frankly also realizing that I, I'm not going to go into any customer that any of you guys have worked out or work in and say, replace every server with us, guys. It's going to be awesome. By the way, imagine VMware had the exact same conversation in 2001. We got this great technology called virtualization. Just put everything in your data center on us. It's going to save you a lot of money. And they got laughed out of the room. But, uh, test dev for Microsoft workloads. OK, that, that sounds pretty good. Right? So how do we do the same thing here? What is that narrow aperture? What are the core use cases that make sense to do first? A lot of them are not virtualized or, poor, or partially virtualized today. There are environments that are highly secure. There's a lot of fear. They usually have clear ownership. They're often federated workloads. And so re when I say like Active Directory, it's a good example of that. Or the things we were talking to a CIO and he goes, yeah, can you guys do something with Windows Server 2003 because it's not supported anymore? We're like, yeah, we can do that. Do you have a problem? He goes, I have 1,467 servers. with." The guy knew the exact number. That, it says, I have a few, sure. I have exact number in the thousands. It's clearly a problem for that organization. What's that path for migration? Like in the past 2001, there was you know, P to V, a server to get it onboarded. What's that path like? To P to V it? or V to V. Uh, the, one of the reasons we picked Zen is its relative compatibility with Amazon and a push for a lot of people to move a cloud-first option. So there's qualifying workloads for Amazon, makes easy portability. In fact, there's, with the SRIO V mode, we have not encountered, uh, there's been a handful of small ones, but not a lot of compatibility issues. We really optimize on compatibility up front, and then testing within specific use cases. And then you said the virtual machine is your smallest unit. Uh, currently, yeah. you don't. So you don't currently today support multiple workloads per VM, or at least that's not what you would recommend. Uh, you could, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, because you can't guarantee anything specifically further into the virtual. Right. Like if you ran like ten containers in a single virtual machine, right, it'd be cool, but you wouldn't have per container isolation today. Understood. Thank you. Uh, let's take the next one. So Dan will go into more detail on this, but to give you an idea, we went back and said on January twentieth between um, 
half a day between uh, noon this day and midnight on the 21st on a window of it looks like 6 p.m. to about 5 a.m. show me all the traffic this was a virtual machine directionality of flows created destinations by DNS and what the orange line is the policy in effect at that time of who created that policy that allowed that specific traffic through and you can drill down and get the entire history of that policy and its life cycle let's take the next one so what are the sort of deployment use cases? I bolded the ones we're seeing come up a lot, okay? Be, you know, if you kind of think of like a shotgun, the shotgun approach is everything. The more targeted ones where we're investing a lot of time with customers to improve the reporting, uh, like on secure file transfers, what file was transmitted? How big did the file say it was? How much data was transmitted? Who did it go to when? And what, what was the geotag resolution of where the file was transmitted to? Um, and was there a DLP check run against it? AD, we've talked about some of the Kerberos ticket inspection type of capabilities. One of the first things you do is you actually recon your own environment and look for high value uh, workloads. You know, and are they unsecured? Are there instances of Active Directory that your domain controller is syncing to that aren't read only and that are not protected on the system? That's probably worth knowing. How do we simplify the audit reports and make them available to people? Uh, SDN controllers has come up and we've been you know, deploying Think of the worst case scenario. What happens if somebody hacks your SDN controller? I mean, dear God, you want a scary environment. Or what happens if somebody uses like zero touch provisioning and then says, let me connect to the BGP core, which isn't using that RFC that does TTL measurement, injects a slash 32, what's in the boot script? Oh, look, there's the username and password to connect to the SDN controller. Now let me download all the VXLAN IDs, all the VNIs, and all the MAC addresses and IP addresses. With that information, can I bypass any policy enforcement point in that virtualized data center and say, I'm going to skip the firewall and go right to the host and establish an adjacency with them? That's the challenge of some of these environments. If you're pre-caching those credentials, if there's no encryption of that information is distributed, those are things that can happen and over time, unfortunately, will happen to people who aren't prepared and don't secure them properly. Now, I love the concept of jump host. It protects from a lot of things like that. I was talking to a financial company the other day who goes, yeah, I can get to 50,000 devices via SSH from my desktop. That's a little scary. In the, in the exposed DMZ application yeah. piece, I mean, typically, like Greg said, like there'd be an F5 or some kind of load balancer up front that's, Absolutely. but we rely on sometimes doing SSL termination on that to do funny things with the back end traffic. There. I would still stick with it there in that scenario. Okay, but yeah. the, so then would that mess with any of the SSL stuff you're doing on Not box? at all. Do a straight pass through then. We have a transparent mode that supports V4 and V6 mm -hmm. and does no NAT or PAT on the device, or we can do a full NAT PAT function on the box. Both options are supported. Is that what you see most customers doing, or do in they the like DMZ, the idea? Okay. In the DMZ for web servers behind a firewall, if they have an SSL certificate termination dependency to use SSL ID to bind a mm -hmm. shopping cart or something, it would be exactly as you identified. Okay, cool. Um, branch is interesting, not just branches, but it's like branches in regulated industries where they're required to have servers that stay in that branch. A retail bank with millions of dollars of cash will never have a serverless branch because they're always going to have video security and badge ID security readers there. Those need to be secured. We've seen attacks executed by red teams and banks against their ATM machines that said, I popped, you know, took four screws off the back, popped the lid, went in, connected to a, a router in there, reset it, did password recovery, and next thing you know, I'm root on the router. Was there any signature signed code on that router to verify that the software running on it was what it was supposed to be? No. And then they're able to go and you know, use that as a launch pad. Right? These are some of the scenarios that we can start protecting against. But trusted application deployment in hostile locations. I was talking to a university. They have multiple DNS servers. They put them at other universities for geodiversity. It's a really great model. And you go, my workload is running on a server in somebody else's data center. How do I manage that? How do I show them that I'm not connecting to things I shouldn't be or that something there is misbehaving and trying to connect to me without putting, as one of our customers said, $50,000 of servers and surrounding it with $500,000 of network security gear to establish my little enclave out in the world? How do we do that just in the box? That's where we can save a lot of money for customers in those kind of remote environments. Manufacturing, uh, hospital clinic, hospital supply chain type of things, banks, um, go back to the online gambling where the random number generators are running, those types of scenarios are all things where this makes a lot of sense. And by the way, there's a lot of environments where it doesn't. Yeah. Right? Small retail and a strip mall around here will never have one of these boxes in there. So be very clear about where it makes sense and where it doesn't. Out of compliance app, XP 2003, 2008 is coming up on its end of support, end of security update window. Yet, you talk to companies, and it still exists. I think France had an airport go down 
about a month ago because Windows 3.1.1 crashed. Windows 3.1.1, I used that in high school. Okay. It, this should scare you a lot, but it crashed, and it brought an aer airport's infrastructure down. Right? So those applications exist, and the, the fundamental problem is a guy wrote it, and then he moved on and retired. It was a nice application, it was necessary, but it wasn't so important they were going to pay for somebody to go back in and rewrite it from scratch. They let it limp along. Fast forward a few months, fast forward a few years, fast forward a few decades, they don't even know who wrote it anymore, they still depend on it, and there's still no budget to fix it until it's fixed on fail. And so how can they proactively go after and secure these types of applications without having to go back and rewrite it? It's, it's a cheaper fix than the alternative. So critical think, process control functions. Yeah, that are running on outdated operating systems that aren't supported anymore, outdated development frameworks. That, I mean, look at some of the early Java stuff, you know, some of the Corbis stuff. And a lot of those aren't supported anymore. They used outdated crypto libraries that were embedded in there. There's no choice for the business. They either are out of compliance and out of audit, or they rewrite an entire application. What we're trying to do is give them another choice, somewhere in the middle. Is it perfect? It's not perfect. Rewrite is perfect. Rewrite is expensive right? and time-consuming. Do you have any prepackaged apps yet in terms of partnering with other vendors and other application providers? Or? Starting to, and I think you'll see a lot more of those coming over the next three to six months. The initial focus is around apps in this area, where it's very clearly defined, and some here in the branch as well, where we know it's going to be this DNS server and this virtual router, you know, this WAN accelerator running on our system. Let's go to the next one. So let me give you a proof, a proof point, and then I'm going to pass it over to Dan. The proof point is we did a test. We took Windows 2012 R2 out of the box, left it wide open, took Nessus vulnerability scanner, loaded every plugin, and nuked it for a couple hours and said, what do you get? Oh, what you get was a lot of bad hygiene things in yellow, critical vulnerabilities, these are the worst, remote code execution, what every security guy you know, is like, has nightmares about. One was a vulnerability in Microsoft S channel, which is their secure channel between servers, and another was a vulnerability in HTTP.sys. These affected 2008, 2003, 2012, and pretty much every version, and every variant. Um, patchable to be fixed if you went out and had the ability to do that across your entire environment. Um, Tended, you know, I just talked to a customer at 150 unpatched ones like two weeks ago, right? Out of about 400 servers total, so it's fairly prevalent. These could be used to completely on a server, load, you know, malware in that would connect back to a command and control network and take it over. Could be then used to dump the lsas.exe file and get the tickets that are used for Kerberos, masquerade as a super admin, create their own accounts, and completely on an environment. Um, Let's hit a space bar, and what you'll see is we then said, let's test micro-segmentation. The way we did this, we took a commercially available firewall, said let's permit only port 443 to connect to this virtual machine from only a particular host that would be an adjacent neighbor of it. What would it see? Well, it did clean up a lot of the you know, errata down here, and a lot of the bad hygiene things disappeared. The ones that are remaining are ones that are obviously at an application layer. Weak Cypher suite support, self-signed certificates, SSL v2 and v3, not using TLS. These are things that most firewalls in a general port-based implementation or something doing IP sets and tables doesn't control. Thus, the two critical vulnerabilities still exist. Then we put it inside of a compartment on us and loaded the shield web function, loaded the SSL certificate on, acting on behalf of the workload, did credential masquerading. <coughs> And the criticals went away. The bad hygiene ones, except it has a TTL greater, you know, greater than one, so something forwarded an IP packet and there existed. But my favorite is OS identification. Nessus believed this was a Linux server running Windows 2012. If you go back to like MITRE's model and cyber resiliency framework, you know, segmentation's one out of like 14 things you're asked to do. Obfuscation and deception is another one. If the bad guy thinks it's Linux, he's going to launch a different attack vector against the workload. The likelihood of hitting a tripwire somewhere in a system and doing one thing wrong is so much higher when you don't know what you're attacking. In fact, they probably won't attack it if they don't know what it is, and they'll go somewhere else. The great part about hardware is, in order to defeat hardware, somebody has to buy that hardware and figure out how to break that hardware. And so, because hacking is becoming a for-profit thing, a lot of people avoid spending that money and go after the low-hanging fruit. <coughs> Last slide, this is what I want you to think about. If I aggregate the type of capabilities that we've built into the system, now our goal was the 80-20 rule in these, okay? I will offer that we do not have 100% of the features for the coolest thing in every one of these categories, and we never will. 
It's not our goal. Our goal is to build the 20% of the features in each of these categories that 80% of the customers use and or are not taking advantage of and should, especially in the mid-market where they're underserved and they don't have those capabilities readily available. So we said, what tool would you use to do each of these? And for each one of these, I can guarantee if you go to RSA in a month and a half and you walk around, you will find three to five companies doing every one of these things here on the right. That's cool. Write them down, do your list, say these are the ones I would deploy to really secure an important critical node in my system. A key manager, a certificate manager, the Windows update server in my red forest, my domain controllers, my secure administrative workstations. And then ask yourself, what tool would I use at the very top to provide operations management across the entire suite of things I've deployed? <laughs> the problem I think we faced in the security industry that we fortunately didn't face in networking because there was one large company that had a, you know, a mass of success in that industry is compatibility and interface between different vendors. You know, in networking, everybody built something that tried to interact with Cisco CLI and SNMP and be as compatible as possible. So we, everybody went to that norm. Now we could argue that was CLI the best or should it have been something else? It was the best we had in the 80s when it was created. It was the best we had in the 90s when it scaled. And so we all used it. Over here, who is the dominant player in, in security? Who is the 20% player in security? None exists. The space is so diverse that there's no one company that has 20% share of the aggregate of security. In fact, I'd argue it's evidenced by the fact it's a $20 billion infrastructure, security infrastructure market with $45 billion a year spent on integration, consulting, and managed services. It tells me that there's a complexity problem that exists and people have to take all of these products and make them all work together. So we said, that's really hard to do. And that's what we set out to do, to build, give that level of visibility and optics to a customer. So they can see the, the VM move and correlate it to the log. They can create a whitelist and do a PCAP based on the whitelist getting missed and report it all back through a common infrastructure. 